All right, open your Bible, if you would, to Exodus. We're going to spend the vast majority of our time in Exodus. We'll jump around a little bit. Last week, we, uh, as you know, we're, we're talking about our, this is our growth series, right? We want to grow and learn from the people that are doing it, right? If you want to learn how to build a stadium, you go to the people who have built the stadium. If you want to learn how to uh, dissect a frog, go to any teenage kid. No, I'm kidding. Don't go to the teenage kid. You want to learn how to dissect a frog, you go to the people who have dissected a frog. You learn from the people who are doing it. So that's what we're doing. We're going through the Bible systematically, in some cases, (laughs) and we are just kind of looking at how people grew throughout a variety of circumstances. And Well, I tell you, one of the people where we can learn a lot from is Moses. Last week, we talked about Shamgar, right? Essentially, one, we'll give him two verses in the book of Judges. And uh, and we learned a lot from that. Now we get to Moses, who is just littered all over the Bible. His name is everywhere. In the Old Testament, he's mentioned over 750 times by name. That's a lot of mentions. In the New Testament, he's mentioned over 75 times. Again, a lot of mentions. When we get to the book of Deuteronomy, he did write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He wrote those five books, which is known as the Pentateuch. He wrote those. It's actually called the five books of Moses. When we get to Deuteronomy, a book that he wrote, we don't find him as one of the main Uh, main commentators or the main people, he was the only. (laughs) Some people have called it his uh, valedictorian speech. And there's a lot to be said about Moses, and we can grow from this particular individual. There's there's so much to cover that we can't cover it all, but there's, there's a lot we can learn. When you try to move forward, when you try to grow, There will always be somebody in your life that will hold you back. What happens is you actually grow away from the people who remain still, right? And those people who remain still are usually convicted about your growth, and they will try to hold you back from growing. And we're going to see that in the life of Moses. But what you do with those people will determine where you end up. How are you able to grow even though people are holding you back? The, the, the book of Exodus is, is, uh, is a book of leavings, right? It's leaving one place and going to another, and that's exactly what Moses was doing. He was rescuing the people of Israel from bondage and captivity. And you know what? There were a lot of people who held him back. A lot of people didn't, didn't really go along with this plan, and we're going to look at that in a moment. But what I really want to talk about this morning is three characteristics of people that cripple growth. Three characteristics of people that cripple growth, okay? And you want to avoid these groups of people, but you will have to deal with them as you grow, okay? As we grow this year in 2020, and we're going to grow through this pandemic, we're going to grow individually, we're going to grow uh, as, as a group. I'm going to have to take a couple things uh, for for granted. I'm I'm just going to have to take for granted that you know a little bit about the story of Moses, that you know what he did, some of his accomplishments. Essentially, he was rescuing the people of Israel from captivity, from bondage in Egypt. And he was going to take them literally from captivity to Canaan. He was going to rescue them out of their sufferings. That took some time. It took, well, essentially five books of the Old Testament as they kind of go over a lot of these things, four specifically. Leading people to grow is not easy. Leading people to grow isn't easy. These three characteristics are very, very important. First of all, number one, you have the disinterested people. The disinterested people. There are people who are just disinterested in growing. They, just, they are fine with being complacent. They would rather not move from where they are. 
They're just not interested. Matter of fact, when you begin to talk uh, to the church about this idea of growing, you'll have some people who kind of kick against that a little bit. They're just disinterested. They don't want, they don't want to move from where they're at. Uh, they, get, uh, they get complacent, not content. Two different words, two different meanings. They get very complacent. They would just rather not leave from where they are. And this was essentially the people of Israel to start. Moses tried to rescue the people of God, you see, and it didn't go very well. In Exodus chapter 2, in Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, you see Moses' heroic attempt to try to rescue the people of God. And it came to pass in verse 11, in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He goes out there and he sees his his friends, his brethren, out there getting beat up by the Egyptians. And he looks around him and he says, I'm going to take this guy out. He goes out, kills this Egyptian, buries him in the sand. Verse 13, and when... He went out the second day. Behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. So now he sees his brethren fighting between each other. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. See, he knew he had been had. He was trying to solve the problems of the Egyptian fighting the Hebrews, and then he tries to solve the problem of the Hebrews fighting the Hebrews. The Hebrews didn't want anything of it. And so who made you the prince and the judge? Who put you over us, Moses? This was his first attempt, and you know what? I tell you what, I don't think the people were real interested in following him. Do you ever wonder, you ever wonder why? Do you ever wonder why the people, why the Hebrews didn't say, hey, this is a guy who actually stood up to these Egyptians? Uh, here's a guy, here's a guy who went out there and was able to literally lay his life on the line for us. And you know what? Uh, this is somebody that we can follow. They weren't interested. You would think that the, that the people would have said, hey, you know, I'm sick and tired of getting abused by our taskmasters. I'm sick and tired of being, being oppressed by, by the Egyptians. And you know what? I want out of this, and this is the guy that can take us out. One would think that all these people would be interested. But you know what? Growth is hard, isn't it? Getting people to come along with your vision is not always the easiest thing. Growth means leaving the status quo. <laughs> can you imagine leaving the status quo? That's just like everything is fine the way it is, you know. Don't, don't disrupt the apple cart. Let's, let's, if, 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 it's not, if it's not broke, don't fix it. The status quo, you have to leave the status quo if you want to grow. You have to leave the status quo if you want to grow. You know, growth means leaving the status quo. Growth also means change, doesn't it? Now, that's a scary word for some. Growth means change. It means doing something different, being somebody different. It means adding to, in some cases, subtracting in order to add to. You know what that is? That's risk. Growth means risk. And for those people who are risk-averse, growth is very, very scary. Now, I tell you, I'm not risk-averse, but I don't tie little ropes on my uh, feet and jump jump off a bridge, and I don't jump out of airplanes. I'm not afraid of a little risk. But there are some people that are just so afraid of risk, they'll never take a chance, and they'll never grow. Because growth means change. Growth means change. Now, it's not just for, uh, you know, Mo, or for the people Moses was trying to lead out of captivity. Uh, growth and the risk and all of these things are also applied to Moses. You see, Moses tried to res- rescue the people of God. But God tried to rescue the man of God, didn't he? Growth was important for Moses as well. And leaders are faced with the same challenge. 
you know, after a while, after this uh, Egyptian was, was killed, buried in the sand, after a while, God told Moses, go back there and rescue the people. You know what? <laughs> he didn't want anything of it. He says, you know what, Lord? I've been there, and I've tried that, and they don't want me. How many of y'all have tried something, you failed, and then you're hesitant to try it again? You, you, you try something, you stumble, you make a complete disaster out of it, and then, and then trying to do it again is just not, just not what, what you feel called to do. See, leaders are faced with the same challenge. You know what? God showed himself evident in Moses' life. He said, you go do this. The people will listen. Moses said, well, how, how, are, how are they going to do that? And he said, well, I'm going to give you a rod. And you throw it on the ground, it becomes a snake. You pick up the rod, you pick up the snake, it becomes a rod again. He says, how's that for evidence? Who can do that? Well, the magicians seem to mimic that. So he said, what about this? What about this? Uh, you take your hand, you put it into your bosom, and you can't pull it out. It's leprous. Put it back in, you pull it back out, it's not leprous anymore. Well, Lord, I don't know about that either. Well, how about this? You take some, take some water from the river, pour it on the sand, it'll become blood. What do you think about that? Oh, I don't know, Lord. And you know what Moses did? He keeps coming up with excuses. Isn't that amazing? One commentator said this. Even armed with these powerful evidences of the presence of God with him, Moses raised still another objection. Another objection in Exodus 4, 10 through 11. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or seen or the blind? Have not I the Lord? You see, you will always find an objection even when there isn't one. There will always be a set of circumstances that are just too big. And you know what? We can always make excuses. There will always be an objection to grow if you're the leader or if you're leading people to follow you. There's always an objection, isn't there? How many objections? How many, how many times in our own lives, personally, have we, had, have, have we made excuses for the reason we, we can't grow? And yet God is still showing himself faithful in our life. And he says, well, I gave you that miracle, and I gave you that miracle, and I gave you that miracle. But fine, you know what? Just take Aaron with you. He'll be your spokesman. Eventually, you're going to run out of excuses that you have to finally deal with it. But there will always be this, these excuses. There will always be objection, objections to grow, especially when you're dealing with disinterested people. People will, people will not be your friend because you have a desire to grow. People will leave a church because you have a desire to grow. People will quit their jobs because you have a desire to grow. People generally are afraid of change. They're afraid of risk. And you know what? Trying to get disinterested people interested can be very, very challenging. But we all are very disinterested at times, right? How about those things in our life when we read our Bible and God really begins to tighten down the screws in our life and he says, you need to have a better marriage. Whoa, whoa, that takes a lot of work. You need to train your kids better. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, hold on a second. I want better kids, but I was hoping, Lord, that you would do this. That's why I'm praying. Well, I would like some more. I'd like some more money, Lord, but, you know, that takes a lot of work. And I was just, I was praying that you just give me a blessing. And if I get blessed, maybe my, maybe my daddy would die and he would leave me with an inheritance or something, right? I mean, a, a wise man leaveth an inheritance for his children's children. So I guess I'd need my grandpa to die because <laughs> that'd be the grandkids. See, my kids aren't going to get anything, but, your, but the grandkids, they'll be all right. That's a wise man. You see, it takes a lot of work, doesn't it? And there's a lot of people who just aren't interested. So you have the disinterested people. Number one, the disinterested people. Number two, you have the, the disgusted people. You have the disgusted people. Now, when you're trying to lead people out of a bad place, for some reason, they always seem to want to go back to the bad place, right? But why is that? Why is it that when, you, when someone's in a bad place, you try to lead them out, but they always go back? Well, Proverbs 26, right? 
As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Why do dogs eat their throw up? I, I just, I let, you know, when the dogs throw up, I, I, don't, I don't rush over there to push the dog away. I'm like, he's not going to do it again, is he? He's doing it again. I can't believe he's doing it again. And then they'll throw up again, and I'll be like, not a chance. It's just he does it again. I'm like, the Bible says this. So then I say, honey, will you clean up the dog? <laughs> and she says, but they're, they're dogs. So then mom cleans up the vomit. Or we just let the dog. Why is that? They're just, people always want to go back to the same place that they came from, even though it was bad. And when things don't go the way that we think they should go, we complain, right? We think things should go a different way. Imagine the Israelites coming out of, out of Egypt. Finally, they get convinced that, okay, this is the real deal. And you know what? Moses is going to lead us to the promised land. And you know what? They began to complain when things didn't go their way. In Exodus 16, in Exodus 16, verses 2 to 3, when things didn't go the way they thought they should, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Verse 3, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. I would rather die back there. I get it, Moses. We were in a terrible, terrible, terrible place. And many, many of us Hebrews were dying, but you know what? I would rather die back there. When we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, you guys, listen, you, you brought us out here in this desert place to kill us. Numbers 11, 4 to 5, and the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. The children of Israel also wept again, and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish, which we did eat in, the, in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. We remember all of these good things we used to have. All of these really good things. You see, people aren't happy because things aren't the way they used to be but they're not happy with the way things used to be. And that is why growth is so important. It moves us from one area to another area, and it's, it's never just that easy, is it? And you're going to get a handful of these disgusted people when things don't go the way they should because of the risk involved. There's risk. There's, there's, there's risk in having a new venture, isn't there? Having a new venture. You want to you wanna do something new? You want to start a new business? It takes a little risk, doesn't it? How about, how about learning something new? That takes a risk. What if you get a bad grade? What if you fail the class? What if your instructor looks at you like you're an idiot? I know exactly what that looks like, by the way. <laughs> I had that happen to me all through high school. What, what are people going to think if I don't do well? What if I don't get that, that piece of paper on the wall? And can I tell you what? It's a piece of paper. I've got a lot of pieces of paper on the wall, and they're just pieces of paper. It doesn't add one cubit to my stature. But you know what? Learning something new is, is, is challenge. That's risky. How about hiring a new person? That's risky. What if things don't work out the way they should? What if we can't afford it? That's risky, isn't it? How about, to buy, how about buying something new, right? The boys just bought a, another truck. Actually, I mean, I bought it. <laughs> They're too young to buy it, but I bought it. I don't need, I've never even test drove it. I've never even seen it. <laughs> Tell me that's not risky, right? I mean, I think I know what it looks like. I saw a little picture. I'm hoping it drives nice. The guy says, can we do the deal or not? I said, let's do the deal. 
I got them way, 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 way low. It's still a lot of money. But I got them way, 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 way low. And then I said to him, I said, what else can you do for me? <laughs> and he says, listen, I, you know, there's just no money in this. I mean, we, 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 I mean I, what, if, what if, what if, what if, what if I was able to, to, to make, make the first payment for you? I'm like, now we're talking. I said, now we got a deal. He says, all right, well, I'm going to write this thing up. I said, and one more thing. I said, it needs a bedliner. And he says, Joe, there's, there's, they're, they're 300, $395. I can't do a bedliner. There's $300 in this. I can't do that. I mean, I'm telling you right up front, there's $300 in this. We will lose money if we do that. We will lose $95. And then I was silent. <laughs> and then he chimed in and said, well, uh, would, you, would you be willing to go half with me? And I said, you got yourself a deal. <laughs> a lot of risk there, anyway. It's just a lot of risk. And you know what? When that risk becomes danger, let me tell you what, people become very disgusted when things don't go the way they think it should. And then they begin to complain. And all the complaining is against God anyway. I can't not share this verse out of Exodus 16. All this complaining is really against the Lord. In Exodus 16, verse 8, the end of the verse says, For that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. If God has set you on a course to do something and it doesn't work out the way that you thought it would, you're not necessarily murmuring against the person who led you, but against God, right? Essentially, he is the one who led you. So you get these disinterested people and you get the disgusted people. And thirdly, thirdly, you get the distracted people. You get the distracted people. You know, focus is one of the hardest things not to get distracted from. We, we, we lose our focus all the time. When we get distracted from our goals, we lose. When you get distracted from your goals, you'll lose. It's, it'd, be ama- it'd be amazing how many times in, in history, probably, probably a, a, a couple times, where you see a wide receiver catch the football and they run toward the other end zone. And you see everybody shouting and telling them to stop. And they're thinking, yeah, they're excited, you know. (laughs) No, we're not excited. That means stop. This doesn't mean go. This means stop. See, it's kind of a universal sign, you know. And you know, when when, when you get distracted and you lose your focus, you'll never reach your goals and you'll lose. And so Moses was a growth leader. But when he was out of sight for just a little too long, you know what happened? The people got distracted, didn't they? The people got distracted. And it's been said that when the cat's away, the mice play. And here's exactly what happened. Exodus 31, or 32, Exodus 32, verse 1. Exodus 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, because guess what? They needed a leader. And said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. So now we we need some gods to worship. This guy that brought us out of Egypt, I don't know where he's at. Where's the leader? So, But but you know what? We get get distracted just like that. He, He wasn't gone for all that long. And Moses was on the mount doing the work of God, and, the, and then, and then the, the children of Israel just become unhinged. How long does it take you to become unhinged, distracted from your goal, from your growth goal? How long does it take you to lose your focus of your growth? It happens so fast, doesn't it? It can happen so fast. In verse 7 of Exodus 32, and the Lord said unto Moses, <laughs> I want to see this replayed in heaven. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt. They've corrupted themselves. It's like, well, Lord, you called me here, right? <laughs> you told me to come here, and my people are getting unhinged. But notice this that they corrupted, corrupted themselves. Nobody did it to them but them. When you think about your life and how fast you become unhinged, when you when you get distracted. You know whose fault that is? It's your fault.
How did they do this? You know, they, they, they lost their focus. They went, from, they went from bad to worse. They needed something, but they got distracted. They were a group of distracted people, weren't they? I tell you, when we are trying to grow this year, if you are a leader, a growth leader, if you're trying to lead your family, if you're trying to lead your, uh, lead your, your, your fellow employees, if you're trying to, to lead your employees, can, can, I, can I tell you, if they're disinterested in growth, they're not going to grow. And if by chance they do, when things don't go the way that they thought they would, they're going to be disgusted. And then they're going to begin to murmur and then complain. And then I tell you what, then what's going to happen is right here, thirdly, they're going to get distracted. They're going to get distracted from the goals that you hopefully collectively have come together in agreement upon. I wish growth was easy. I wish it didn't take such hard work. I, I really wish, I wish it didn't take such hard work because it takes hard work. Yesterday, I was, uh, I was doing some drywall with Phil. We were out at a guy's house. I came back. It was probably 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was, it was hot. Monday, Tuesday was beautiful. Wednesday was all right. It just gets worse, right? So I'm starting to complain. <laughs> Must be disgusted. And uh, we come back here, and the boys had mowed uh, eight, these, these eight houses over here, the Shipman, Sandra, so maybe 10. They've just finished the church, and... and, uh, and and I come inside, and I'm just tired. It was hot. I didn't have the AC run in this house. And I laid down in the cafe area on the, on the pews that are in there. And I looked up at the ceiling, and uh, I had this flashback of when, it was, when that was my office. You know, I went from that office to a shipping container that was out here that I made, and then, and then we moved to this headquarter building where all the staff's at. And it's a beautiful office, and I feel like I'm, I'm spoiled over there. But I remember just laying down, looking at the ceiling, and, and, and I thought to myself, I remember seven years ago when we came here, it was so easy. It really was easy seven years ago. I mean, it was, uh, there, was, there was no employees, you know? That always makes it a little easier when there's no employees, right? You don't, you don't have to worry about anything like that. You don't have to worry about them eating <laughs> because they're not your problem. They're someone else's problem, right? So, so there's no employees, there was, uh, we weren't writing any books, right, Joel? I mean, we were just, it was, it was, kids were small. They were this big. They were knee-high to a grasshopper. I guess that's a thing. But now they're as tall as me. And uh, so they would go in the back room, and they would do their, do their schoolwork. And then every now and again, I would come out, and I would tackle them, come out of my den. And it was just so easy. There was, we weren't leading trips to Israel, weren't writing books. We didn't have a learning center. Oh, we also, the church was small. We only had five people, so I guess that was a, another whole other story. We didn't have the properties, right? And I thank God we sold the property in Moline. Now we're just down to two, so that's good. But we didn't have that problem. It was just very, very easy. It was very, I could kind of do whatever. It was just, I was just, I'd go in there and I'd read and I'd study. And I would eat, because that's the Baptist thing to do, right? Even when you're not gathered together, you eat. You got to eat. And it was just, it was so easy. There was no problems. And now it's just like, you know, one thing after another thing, and then you have a new idea and a new venture and a new hire, right? And we got 10 people right now on staff, which is crazy when, when, uh, when uh, Ashlyn comes and Joe comes, and then we got Phil. So that makes, was that 12? And that's a lot of mouths to feed. And then we want to start something in this building for child care, and that's going to be a, a, a headache, Right? And it's just fun, isn't it? Isn't it a good challenge? Because, I mean, I could be in my office reading all day with no risk, no challenge. My kids and I, we talk about this as their business goes. It's a risk-reward. The greater the risk, the greater the reward, but also the greater the risk. And aren't you just excited that you don't have to be back in Egypt the problem is, is we always think about what it was like in Egypt. No different than me laying on the pews in that room yesterday at 3 o'clock looking at the ceiling, looking up at the ceiling and saying, Lord, it was so much easier back then. It's not, it's not a challenge. You know, we are going to deal with people 
as leaders, but also as individuals. You guys will be struggling with this your whole life if you want to grow. And we can grow in a pandemic. What, 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 a, what, a, what a blessing to be able to grow in a pandemic, to be able to add staff. We gave raises. I mean, that's cool. How many churches are giving raises? How many churches are taking on people? How many churches are, are, are building, adding new things? I just love that. But you know what? That's also a lot of risk. But I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And we're going to be faced in the next several years with risk. And if you are risk averse and you're afraid of change, you're afraid to grow. Maybe you want to grow, but you're just afraid of what comes along with that. You're going to be struggling with this. You're going to be struggling with your own self-disinterest. You're not going to be super interested in growing because things are just nice to status, be status quo because I'm comfortable. And then let's say, for instance, you, uh, you get over the disinterested part. And now you're interested. You're more than interested. You're committed to growth. Now you're going to have to deal with people who are just disgusted when things don't go well. And then you're going to have to worry about the distracted people, maybe even yourself. Growth is just not an easy thing. So don't be disinterested, disgusted, or distracted. I hope we're all interested in the things of God. One of the things I'm most interested in about the things of God is salvation. Phil, when you left the other day, it was really neat. I had an opportunity to talk to the owner. And uh, we talked about Roman Catholicism a little bit. He, he asked me, he says, if you don't mind me asking, <laughs> I knew what that meant. Anybody, anybody ask that question, kind of probing like that? If you don't mind me asking, you can just assume it's about religion or politics, which I'm happy to answer both. <laughs> he says, were you Baptist by birth? I had to scratch my head up. I thought, I don't, I don't know, was I born in a Baptist hospital? Or? I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I came forth out of water, so I mean, I was once in the water, I was out of the water, maybe that... I said, no, I wasn't Baptist by birth. I was Roman Catholic. And so being the guy I am, I said, you know what my problem with the Roman Catholics are? Of course, I said this before I knew that his wife was Roman Catholic. <laughs> hate when I do that. Ugh. Well, there are many words that wanteth not sin, right? So anyway, when many words are spoken, rather. So, yeah, so I, I, I thought to myself after I said that, I said, oh, man. I said, no, I, I was actually, I was born, I was, I was Roman Catholic. I said, you know what my problem with Roman Catholics are? They believe in works for salvation. As a, as a whole, as a whole. Now, there are some people within the Roman Catholic Church that don't believe in works for salvation, which is phenomenal. But as a whole, the Roman Catholic Church believes you can work your way to heaven. I, I did everything but bring out my wallet and show them the wallet illustration. And, and I should have. I should have. And I, and, and I will, actually. I will do that. Because I can always go back to that and be like, hey, there was something else I want to add. I said... A lot of people think you can just earn your salvation by your good deeds. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's to him that worketh not. I said, so that's what really got me excited. The Bible says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. I said, it's not about your Roman Catholic Church. And I said, there are a lot of Baptists who aren't saved going to heaven. I said, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not of your church. It's not of your water baptism. It's not about giving money to the church. I said, it's not about making a confession in a booth to a father. I said, it's when you, in the quietness of your own mind, trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's what I told him. It's made, it's made he really slowed down. He's like, oh, really? He says, you know, I've always had that problem, too, with the Catholics. <laughs> I said, well, you take that up with your wife. <laughs> Later, we'll do marital counseling. <laughs> Super guy. And I tell you what, I'm so thrilled that Jesus saved me. And that it's not by works of righteousness, which I've done, but according to his mercy, he saves me. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that it's not your works? Because if it was your works, you'd never make it. How would you know if your works are good enough? You'd never know if you've turned from enough sin. How do I know if I've turned from enough sin? How do I know if I've lived a good enough life? I'm so glad that there's, uh, that's, not, that's not part of salvation. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this, I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us, hates our sin. 
To go to heaven, you have to be sinless. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's not getting water baptized. Problem is, you still have the sin. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for our sin. He died on the cross for our sin. Lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sin. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. See, what happens is when you trust Jesus Christ, that his death was sufficient, his burial and his resurrection was sufficient, when you believe Jesus to be the Son of God, that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again, you get eternal life. Not by works of righteousness, which you have done. But according to his mercy, he saves us. I'm so thankful that salvation is simple for us. Now, he had to die so that we could live. If you haven't placed your faith in Christ alone as your Savior today, I pray that you would. I think I know most everybody here, so I, I think everybody has. I know pretty much all those people on Zoom. But if you haven't done it, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, please place your faith in Christ alone for your salvation. Do that today. Would you do that?